Welcome back to a Celtic State of Mind. It's Thursday afternoon. I'm Paul John Dykes, and today I'm delighted to be joined by JP Mason. How are you doing, John Paul? Good afternoon, Paul. Uh, good to be back on. Um, and like we were saying before we went on air, I've, I've been not as busy as I normally am, which is a, a welcome um, a welcome surprise to me. I didn't realise I wasn't actually doing... You were like, oh, what have you been up to? I'm like, oh, not actually that much, <laughs> to be honest. So it was the well, first time, but... You're normally extremely busy, yeah, like beyond busy, JP. So I just think sometimes that would be a good thing. But obviously Celtic have been busy. There's plenty to be, to be talking about here. The season has kicked off. It started. Uh, we're underway. And um, all the talk recently has been about transfers, in and outs. How does the transfer window look? Are we weaker, et cetera, et cetera. And just to add fuel to that fire, JP, we sell Carl Starfelt, our first pick centre-half for the last two years who has developed an incredible partnership with Car Carter Vickers. I was working it out this morning, 17.4 games per trophy. So for every 17 and a half games he's played for Celtic, he's won a trophy. Um, five trophies in total, a double and a treble. What's your thoughts on this? I'm pretty, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sad that he's gone because I, I liked him as a player. Um, very reliable. There'll be many people that are probably... Uh, rejoicing at the fact, not not many, but there'll be some people that will be rejoicing at the fact that he's left the club because he he seems to have been a bit of a a marmite player in his time um, mm -hmm. at Celtic, whereby people have called him a bomb scare. Hugh Keevans famously sort of said that he's he's an accident waiting to happen and all this sort of stuff. But I mean, if that is what you call an accident waiting to happen, and he's not lost a league game with. Cameron Carter Vickers, then I'll, I'll take another one of them, please, um, from wherever you're going to get them from. Because I mean, I, you can't you can't argue with the the cold hard facts of Car Stalfet's career, which you have just read out. So it wasn't someone pretending to be Carl Stalfet for the last two years. It was actually Carl Stalfet that was doing the business. And as for him moving to Spain, for whatever reason he's gone, you can't. He's 28 years old, probably 29 soon. Um, you can't really stand in the way. If, if, if you're getting upset about him leaving this football club, then I think you need to sort of take a step back and kind of reevaluate your opinions because life goes on. People leave clubs. It's not ideal, a, a, a game into the season. I get that. But he's left, well, obviously, while the transfer window is still open, we've got... Surely this has not just come out of nowhere um, mm -hmm. to Celtic. It's got to have been indicated probably months ago that this was on the horizon. So, yeah, if we if we are doing the the job that we hope the club are doing in in terms of transfers and forward planning and everything else, then they'll have a list, and they seemingly do have a list of people ready to to come and replace them, um, and. Potentially, if rumours are to be believed, a, 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 a compatriot, a younger uh, version, international as well. Mm -hmm. You can't really moan about Celtic's transfer business if that is the model. Like, sell a guy who's approaching his 30th birthday, get your money back for him, having had two seasons out of him, and successful seasons at that, and then get in a, a sort of younger uh, version. I, I can't, I can't. I don't know why. I don't know if there's any room for complaint there, really. That that's the model working, you know. That that's the only thing that I think isn't ideal. Although I think we can manage it, is the fact that you know his replacement hasn't been in the door a wee bit earlier. You know, in terms of what we did with Johnston um, and you know other players of that ilk. I mean, I even remember Kyogo was in the door before Edward left, and I know Novroski's played yeah. one game. You could argue Navrotsky, though. You could argue that's his replacement. And yeah. the next centre-half we buy is just bolstering the central defence uh, to the point that we've got, you know, three really, really good centre-halves to take us into Europe and the domestic campaign. So that could be the argument. That's what Celtic might come back and say, well, we've just spent £4 million on a Polish uh, mm -hmm. centre-half um, who is an international I don't know. Is he? Is he? Has he been capped for Poland? I'll need to double check that. I mean, my 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 take on Novroski, I think he is the replacement. The 
I'm not going to say it's a downside as the fact he's only played a game. So there's a bedding in period and all that kind of stuff. Mm. And I think we were kind of doing business a wee bit earlier uh, before, but at the change of manager throws everything up in the air, JP. The, uh, the change of circumstances on a personal level for Carl Starfelt, where his partner leaves the country, changes everything, you know. So it might not have happened this way had uh, Jacinta not left for sport in Lisbon. However, you know, Starfelt, he'd been called a consummate professional by Brendan Rogers. He's uh, told us that he said he's we sit down. And you can just imagine Brendan in his office, eh? Go and properly getting tapped into somebody's psyche, JP. Sitting next to Brendan on a long flight would be different than sitting next to Anne Postacoglu, wouldn't it? Uh, you'd, you'd probably get a conversation out of him. I mean, and that is absolutely no dig at Ange Postacoglu. It seems to be... Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, different takes on people sort of having a go at Brendan Rodgers for his uh, managerial approach versus Ange Postacoglu's managerial approach. I saw a, a um, post on Twitter where a guy had really gone two-footed on him based on 20 seconds of of a uh, press conference audio where he, where he was talking about the club's ambitions in the Champions League and mm-hmm. he was comparing it to Ange Postacoglu's uh, sort of, oh, you want me to burst everyone's bubble and say we've got not, not got a hope in hell. He was like, I want them to dream and all that. And he's like, well, contrast that with Brendan Rodgers who's basically trying to dampen our enthusiasm. And you're like, my God, the, some people are just never going to be going to be pleased. Um, I get that people are maybe still a little bit damaged by Brendan Rodgers' um, foray into Europe. We, we did get royally hammered off a lot of teams. Uh, it was not mm-hmm. right. Um, being in stadiums in person, seen as ship, you know, three, four, five, seven goals. Watching mm. Neymar score a hat trick. I mean, that was it was torture. Painful. I don't want to see that we Nyaf do anything against you. Never mind score a hat trick. Um, but he did, and we lost. And but I think as much as everything else, Brendan Rodgers has come back to I think to try and maybe repair that damage uh, and and have a decent shot of it in in Europe. So I'm. I'm, at this point in time, I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt on all of that. Totally, JP. And there's a couple of things from what you've said there. The first one is um, in terms of the, the approach of a manager, you know, and we've, we've spoken out quite a bit about it. G- Jerry and I spoke about it tongue in cheek about the fact that, you know, Ange could do no, no wrong. And now that he's left, you know, <laughs> it's like we're, we're picking away at his approach, you know, and we're looking at what Matt O'Reilly's saying and we're, we're linking that into perhaps there being issues with his approach. There was no issues with his approach. He won the treble last season. He won the double the season before that. There's no issues whatsoever with his approach. You go back to Martin O'Neill, his approach when he was at Celtic, where he wasn't on the training ground, you know, right in terms of a micromanager and all that. And you speak about players who one day they would pass him in the corridor and O'Neill wouldn't speak to them. And then another day they would pass him in the corridor and he, he made you feel great because he did speak to you kind of thing. I, you know, in terms of the approach, I don't mind that. Every manager's going to bring something new to the to the club, and as long as we win, it doesn't really matter to me what the approach is, you know. And you're going to upset a few people along the way. I mean, um, in doing like research for writing books and stuff, I spoke. I was privileged enough to speak to a lot of players who played under Jock Steen, JP. A lot of them didn't like him as a as a man, you know, as a person. There was no real bond in terms of that, but they conceded that he was a phenomenal manager. You know, and and the fact that he was able, he was ruthless, which which is the reason why a lot of people who played under him didn't like him. Because if he wanted to drop you or do anything in terms of getting rid of you, a lot of them were quite bitter about getting obviously sold on. It was for yeah. the betterment of Celtic. So so no one can argue with his approach, you know, to to doing a job. So yeah, we can look at it. And what I keep going back to when it comes to Europe is if you want to look at his time at Celtic first time round. Yes, of course it was disappointing. But what he's done, he's gone away and he took he took a club, a provincial club, right? They are a provincial club in terms of where they are in English football. I don't mean provincial like St. Mirren where they struggle to, to bring in a player if it costs any kind of money. They're not one of the biggest clubs in English football. And he took Leicester to a European semi-final. And people will have that caveat by saying, 
Ah, but it was only the Conference League. It was still a semi-final. So he mm. has learned on the European stage, JP. He's, he's learned he's probably more pragmatic because I think he was a bit gung-ho. We'll play our game. We'll go to PSG away and still play our game and, and it'll be all right. And it wasn't. Barcelona, mm. these teams, you, you just can't play that, that way because they'll pick you apart. They've got too much quality and eventually they can show you up. So I think what we've got now is a, a manager who has learned a hell of a lot in the period that he's been away. Um, he's been criticised, or the club are being criticised, for our lack of um, action in the in the transfer window. JP, is that more about just trying to get the right players in? Because, I mean, Navroski's in. You and I were both impressed with his game against Athletic Club. I'll ask you a wee bit more about, obviously, Ross County, the opener. But um, anybody else we bring in from now, I, I agree with you, will be the backup. But he has spoken about having four centre-halves. So I'm now looking at where we are. Does Stephen Welsh have a future? Does Kobayashi have a future? Lawal, I think, he's a young player who needs game time, put him out on loan. So do we bring in two? And I've heard four names, and most of us have. Uh, Lagerbilk, Mu Muyamba, uh, the Dutch under-19 international from Volendam, Scott McKenna, Nottingham Forest, Harry Suter, Leicester. What do you make of the four names that are um, in the mix, uh, you know, in terms of speculation? Well, there's surely no way we're signing Harry Souter, given that they Leicester paid what fifteen million for him. So they'd be looking to get that back. I would have thought in in, in the in the first instance, would a loan, uh, would a loan. The, the way that Brendan Rodgers has spoke since he came back, I I don't really see him going for loan signings. I, I just mm. I think that would probably haunt him from his his last time when he was absolutely laden with loan signs, all of whom pretty much were not up to the standards that you would expect, or well, certainly not at the standards that he would have expected that. I would be very, very keen to know the exact discussions around the Oliver Burke uh, loan signing and the Jeremy Tolyan loan signing. I mean, Jeremy Tolyan was probably one of the last one of the last, I think, to come in before he left. Did, did, mm -hmm. did Toyan not come in in January? He and did. Brendan was gone in February. And Toyan was did. the one that got sent off against Valencia. I'll never forget that in, in Spain. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think Harry Souter, the, the, the wages and everything else that he's on, I wouldn't have thought it possible. There's also strong talk you would expect that him to be as a Rangers fan because of his. Uh, brother, I, I I don't know if that's fact or not. Um, whatever. We can say. Does he not support yeah. Brecon? No. <sighs> well, I don't know, but I think can move. I can you can move pretty quickly on from Harry Suter. So I'd be uh, astonished if that was a something someday that we were seriously considering Scott McKenna. Uh, I mean, uh, there would there'd be people that would point to the Scottish quota to keep your um, mm -hmm. your homegrown. Uh, Player, or that might be something that they're thinking about. I don't know. I don't know what is Scott McKenna. What is he about? Twenty six. He, he is now. Let me just double check. Twenty. He's twenty eight. Oh, no, he is twenty six. So I was. I was looking at his Scotland caps. He's twenty six. Right, twenty six. So it's you know he's middle of his his, his sort of best years, I suppose. Mm. I don't really know how well he's. I've not kept an eye on him at Nottingham Forest. I know he was. Definitely fondly thought of um, by Aberdeen fans who were sorry to lose him. How he's done since he's been down there, I could not tell you. Um, I, I, I would, I wouldn't want to say, I wouldn't want to rule him out as a possibility just based on the fact that he's Scottish and there'll maybe be that classic snobbery attached to signing a Scottish player and having to shell out probably a significant fee for him. Mm. Um, Miyamba, I really don't know anything about. Uh, it sounds like a, a a sort of classic Celtic scouting uh, signing, and Lager Bielka seems to be the one that's got the most uh, traction because I think his favourite Romano tweeted about him. <laughs> that usually puts some sort of uh, uh, validity on signings. So, and and there's there's there seems to be a lot of, a lot of chat over over that guy and. From his profile, I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't sort of be snooty about that. I would be into 
signing a Swedish international who's coming with, with good stock. Um, and we'll, we'll wait and see what happens on, on that. Yeah, absolutely. And I've got to bring this up because it's my era and it's from Alan Robertson. Good to see you. Good to hear from you, Alan. Uh, hopefully shouting lager, lager in a few days. I love that soundtrack. I love the movie. Uh, back in the 90s, and um, yeah, I could just see us singing that. No, you're right, he's a Swedish international. I'm just double-checking while, uh, while I'm speaking here in relation to your chat about Norovsky. Um, I'm pretty sure he is, but I'm going to have a look because um, I don't want to give false information in relation to his international credentials. He is a f- inter under-21 international, so he's won caps from 15 to 21, JP. Um, and at the age of 22, you'd probably be looking for him to push on to full international status. Um, yeah, the interesting thing about uh, McKenna, you're right, he's 26 year old, right? Um, he's a Scottish international, but I think we need to go back to our initial interest in that player when he was at Aberdeen. And I think we tabled a few bids at the time, who, fairly substantial bids, knocked back Nottingham Forest, bought them for big money. Um, and you think to yourself, I know Rogers was in the building at that time. Was he a, a guy that was earmarked by Rogers? Was it the recruitment team who still like him? Obviously, he's still on file and all that kind of stuff. But you're right, it, you know, the, the Scottish quota. Ha, you know, Harry Souter, although he represents Australia, and I agree with you, by the way, completely your, your kind of uh, price range and everything else. But Harry Souter, um, he came through, obviously, the Scottish development ranks. So w- would he also be classed as being a Scottish quota player as well? Pretty sure he would. Even though he's he's taken an international cap cap for uh, Australia, sixteen caps now. Yeah, but you're right. Uh, Lagerbilk is the guy that uh, seems to be uh, in the mix. Twenty three years of age. Will we get him by the end of the week? I don't quite know. And like you said earlier, um, in terms of Muyamba, looks like he's more of a kind of prospect project style signing. Um, but yeah, Carol Starfield has the party. Be what he's a uh, initial press conference. I was looking through the clips this morning just when I heard the news and he was, um, I just think from the very first, you know, from the very first moment, he was just a very likeable guy. He was talking about Starman, the David Bowie song and whether or not we were going to be chanting that about him. And then obviously, um, I think he got off to a, a difficult start but that doesn't leave a lot of fans' minds, JP. You know, if if we make our mind up about a player, they can play really, really well for a long time after that and the minute they make a mistake, then we're on them. I just think that's that's a natural thing that football fans have got embedded in our minds. Whereas Rio Atat, who I know, you know, is one of the most gifted footballers we've got, his ceiling is is miles ahead and just uh, miles above most other players. Yet he makes a lot of mistakes and he gets away with it. He doesn't get the same kind of pounding that Tony Ralston or Carol Starfield gets. And then there was a few bad performances. I remember um, big big Nisbet. Uh, tore him to shreds in, in the cup, remember, uh, in the cup final and that. And we were kind of on his back at that stage, I think. But over the pace, you cannot argue with his record. And I think last season in particular, JP, he was solid uh, with Carter Vickers. And, you know, the whole kind of love affair with Jacinta and everything else, it, he's a footballer, he's a human being. And it's like, of course, he's going to make decisions based on family and relationships. So we wish him all the absolute best. Do you have a, an issue with the, the transfer fee, a reported £5 million transfer fee? We've, we've made a profit on him. Is that his ceiling? Is that the maximum we could get for a player like Starfield? I mean, I guess it comes to the point where it clearly, well, I mean, if you're speculating, it, it, you're clearly, he, he was looking for a club in a specific league. So mm-hmm. it's then about the clubs in that specific league's budget and what they're willing to Pay. So if if he's gone to Celtic and said, "Look, I really want to move to Spain or Portugal or whatever," then you're only really dealing with one the money that's in that league, two the clubs in that league that are looking for a centre half, and then three the clubs that are looking for a centre half in that league that can afford to pay a transfer fee. Because mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, I can't confess to know what the the money situation is like in the Spanish league. But I wouldn't imagine that clubs in Spain have got Saudi money, you know, where they can just go and overspend. You know, that that for Celta Vigo might be a, a really big signing uh, for them. In fact, it probably is. In terms, of, I, I mean, I'm I'm speaking a bit naively on this, but I don't think I think there must have been some sort of negotiation whereby 
Celtic have just gone right. Okay, well, we'll 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 take what we can get really in this situation where we've got a player who clearly wants to move, and we can't really be looking for uh, crazy money. And I suppose when you look at his age, he's he's obviously approaching twenty nine. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't really. I wouldn't have thought you'd be looking to get, you know, double your money or anything like that. I mean, would would anybody really seriously? I thought we were going to get. 10 to 15 million for Carol Starfair at, at uh, 28 to 29 years old. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought so. Um, so ultimately, we've got two years out of a very, very good player who's been successful and hasn't just... I saw some comments where people were saying, oh, well, he's been fortunate that he's played alongside one of the best centre-halves in Celtic's history in Cameron Carter-Vickers. I think that's really, really... Uh, what's the word? <laughs> Out of order to, to to label that the guy. I mean, the guy, you don't you don't just do well because you're playing alongside somebody who's amazing. Like you do well because mm-hmm. you bring something to the table, and he brought something to the table. Watch Celtic enough in the, in his time home and away to see the performances that he put in, and I I, I thought it was a really really good player for Celtic, and it wasn't. It was quite fearless in terms of putting his head where it hurts and mm-hmm. and was determined. He had that kind of, maybe not quite Christopher Iyer celebrating winning tackles, but it wasn't far off that at times. I thought it was, it was, the t- it was quite a sort of subtle guy that just that didn't want to get beat. You know, you could see that determination in him, whether it's, whether it's a Scandinavian trait or not, I don't know. But, and you also have very thick skin to come through a lot of criticism um, and play through it, which is something that we always say players have to do if they have a sticky, you know, few weeks or whatever, then play through it. And he played through it with the support of his teammates. Clearly, was a popular uh, teammates of uh, mm. Matt really saying um, that him, him and Jota were, were all uh, quite tight and went on holidays together and stuff like that. And and the, now Matt he's on his on his Jack Jones, but I think I think he'll be fine. I mean, Matt, Matt O'Reilly is is potentially going to be one of the players of the season. I think. Um, I hope. I mean, I'm not I'm not on, uh, one to sort of say this or that, but I, I, he's he started well. He has, and the scenario that he's in at the minute in JP with a change, and I'm not I'm not saying this is I'm not saying for a moment that you know he didn't like Ange Postecoglou or Ange's approach didn't suit him. I mean, obviously, we can read into what Matt said a couple of times post-match and that, but I just think that Brendan Rodgers is good for certain players um, at a certain stage of their career, and I think O'Reilly falls into that category, as does Abada, and we might see this season an absolute upturn in their performance and maybe the consistency of their performances as well. You know, we probably said a side of O'Reilly's game was the goals. We have to improve on that. You've seen what Rodgers did with uh, Stuart Armstrong, for example, from midfield, you know, adding the goals to his game takes you to another level. Stuart Armstrong, when he signed for Celtic, did you see him playing? I don't know how long he played for Southampton in the in the EPL, but I mean, a, a lengthy period of time, six, seven years. In the, but did you see that? Did you see that in, in that player? Potentially, yeah, but, you know, under the kind of tutelage of Rodgers, it happened. And that can happen with O'Reilly. It can happen with guys like Abada. Um, and, you know, Brennan Rodgers spoken about a cycle that we're all aware of two or three years, but if you're looking at a player of a specific quality, JP, two or three years, they're going to be at Celtic and then they move on. And then you've got your, your kind of backbone, you know, players like McGregor, um, who's going to be there for a long, long time. And that's why I always go back to the importance of some of the kind of fringe players like Forrest and Tony Ralston. Um, being at the club, it's very important to have that stability because everything else is, you know, changing all the time. All the other parts are being replaced constantly and getting moved on. So Carl Starfelt, he came to Celtic. People come to Celtic for different reasons, for a stepping stone or just, you know, because uh, they, they know that they can come and win honours. Starfelt was done both of them, I guess, stepping stone into a big, a, a bigger league, certainly not a bigger side or a bigger club, but a bigger league. But you were talking about the money that Celtic of Ego have, ha, would spend. And when you look at the signings they've made, um, Starfelt it's been reported as 5 million euros, so 
I'm pretty sure we'll get more information around the, the transfer fee as the days come in. Um, they've also signed uh, Carlos Perez from Roma, and that was for 5.2 million euros. They've signed um, Carlos uh, Doter. By the way, my eyesight's terrible, so if I'm mispronouncing these names, it's due to my bad eyesight, from Castilla, and that was 3 million euros. So they're not the type of club who are going to be spending 10, 12, 15 million pounds on a player, JP. So within their price range, and a massive challenge, huge challenge for Starfield. The comments that O'Reilly uh, made about that trio going on holiday together and all that kind of stuff, um, I, I just see O'Reilly stepping up this season, JP, not just in his performances, but in his, in his importance for the squad. You know, as being not a senior pro as such, but somebody who's now in their third season at Celtic and you're going to get new arrivals, I think O'Reilly becomes a really important part of this team. Uh, yeah, I hope so. Um that there's obviously constantly chat that there's teams I remember seeing maybe it was a, a, a well I was seem to mention him but Fabrizio Romano mentioned um that teams were looking at Matt O'Reilly um this was prior to the window opening I think and he mentioned Brighton um as being one that I mean sh surely surely English teams are keeping tabs on him I'd be absolutely astonished if they aren't um given his trajectory so far to go from mm -hmm. MK Dons to Celtic to then be a, a first team player at Celtic. I know we're not the best league in the world, but you can't be that dismissive of players that do well here that have gone on to do well in England. You know, there's there's a, a fairly long list now of players that have done well in Scotland and therefore and then have translated that to England. So um but I hope we see Matt O'Reilly for another couple of seasons at least. Um, I, I, I really like him. I think he seems like a pretty sound guy. And the, the way that he jumped in in the interview at the weekend, um, and I don't really, I don't, I didn't see that as a dig at Postecoglou. I just kind of thought he's sort of saying he was sort of obviously Turnbull isn't the most um, talkative of, of persons, no. and he's hardly likely to stand talking himself up in a post-match mm -hmm. interview. He's the, probably one of the least likely people to do that. So Matt O'Reilly was just there and went, well, yeah, he should have been playing more, but the competi like, I think he was saying the competition was so strong. You can't argue with three out of three trophies last season. I mean, the manager was clearly picking the right team. Yeah. But in, an, in, another, in another universe where Hatati's injured for a long period of time last season, Turnbull probably gets more game time, providing he was fit. So I think that was more his point rather than, oh, well, he should have been playing instead of X person. or Because obviously Matt O'Reilly is one of the people that he's vying exactly. for a place in the team with. So um, I think he was just making the point that David Turnbull is, is, is good enough. And it's not something it's not something that's come as a surprise to, to us. I mean, we've spoken about David Turnbull many times on here and about where he fits. In, in, in Celtic's system now that there is that strength and depth, but perhaps with Aaron Moy leaving, that opens up. It, it makes him closer to the first team than he than he was last season. And you can't really argue with a start and, and two goals <laughs> and, a, and a really good performance. I'm not entirely sure if it was man of the match. Uh, the stadium gave him man of the match. And remember, mm. thinking who's going to be man of the match in this game? Because... I don't know, to me, there wasn't really a... I didn't see anybody getting a 9 or a 10 on Saturday. There was a good few 8s, a few 7s maybe as well, but I, I didn't see. I didn't feel there was like a, a clear 9 out of 10, 9 or 10 out of 10 performance. But he got man of the match and that'll be good for his confidence, I'm sure, that as well the goals. Yeah, without a doubt. And you know what? There's been transformations physically in quite a few players over the last few few seasons. And I think Hatati's been one of the guys, JP. And I'm looking at David Tumble. I think also that I don't know what extra he's done over the preseason, but he does look as though he's uh, really ripped in terms of, you know, he's got no, he's nothing to him. Um, and I don't know if that's because he's like, this is my big season. It's either I, I'm going to establish myself in Brennan Rogers' side or I move on. And, and you know, after match day one, it looks as though the establishing himself in Brendan's side is the one that's uh, more likely at this stage, certainly. In terms of centre-halves from Sweden then, um, you, we can't really put Lustig in that category, although I know he played there for 
the Swedish national team. He's a right back. Right? You've got Mialbe, you've got Staffelt. And remember big Daniel Mastorovic. Remember him? Uh -huh. um, I've never he, forgotten any. He's, he's not sort of fondly remembered, does he? Like No, really. No, really. No. People people didn't really have a lot of time for him. I, 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 I don't recall him being utterly terrible, but um, I think that was at a time when I was not a season ticket holder. I mean, dare I say this on air and for, for fear of being chastised by people for having the audacity to not have a season ticket for about, what, four years uh, out of the last 25 years, <laughs> um, I didn't have a season ticket. Um, so it was in that time period. So perhaps if I'd seen him week in, week out with my own eyes, I may have a different reflection on Daniel Mastorovic. It would be interesting to look back at some of his performances. I always remember a game that he, he played and he got a, a right bad done in the eye and it was like, you know how sometimes there's a lump and it's like one of the cartoon lumps that just comes out like a, a golf ball. Mm -hmm. And I remember that happened to Mastorovic. He won a couple of trophies with Celtic, a uh, Scottish Cup, I think, in a league uh, between 2010 and 2012. But I, I look back on Starfield's time far more formally than that. I mean, you know, 17 games per trophy. That's unbelievable. Um, I think quite a few players who have played in the, the, the last decade, JP, have got records like that, you know, at Celtic because they've just won so many trophies. Um, and I think we'll look back on him as being very important. When he came in, we really needed a Carol Starfelt. We really needed a centre-half. We were at that stage with that Ange Postecoglou coming at a scenario where the house was on fire, you know, and it was just like, right, you had to try and put this out a wee bit. And the, the signings had to be right. You couldn't make a mistake at that stage. We said, we um, said that. We said that at mm -hmm. the time. Like everyone, everybody that comes in the door here, we can't afford to have, and we did unfortunately have one in James McCarthy. Yeah, but, because we spoke about him at that time and said, "Look, we'll we'll, we'll assess him." But if he was the one, uh, one signing out of that clutch of players that came in that didn't do the business, at least we got away with that one. We wouldn't have got away with. A dud centre half. We wouldn't have Definitely. got away with a dud um, first pick central midfielder who would spend money on. And same with, if, imagine if Kyogo had been a dud, who spent four and a half million on a, on a guy from Japan and he hadn't done the business. That would be that would have been a disaster because where would we have been with Kyogo's goals? And by the way, that could easily could easily have happened. You could easily have signed somebody from Japan who didn't acclimatise, who didn't hit the ground running and score um, a hat-trick early on at Celtic Park. Because obviously, as soon as you do something like that, like you said about Starfield, if someone sort of nails it straight away and scores a hat-trick early on, then mm -hmm. you're like immediately like, right, well, we know he can do that. So he'll do that again. And if Kyogo yeah. hadn't worked, JP, we would, we would have been more reluctant, I think, to go back into that market. So you then mm -hmm. look at the January transfer market, how much different would that have been? And and then the whole thing looks completely different, doesn't it? No, you're well, right. I mean, it's, it's, it's gone the way that everybody of a blue persuasion was uh, predicting it to go, you know, with mm -hmm. their racist remarks about where we were signing players from and all the rest of it. I mean, I can remember it all. I saw it all with my own eyes. Let's not rewrite history. There was, there was a hell of a lot of that and mm -hmm. still is. So... Um, you know what you're saying there about Mastorovic, right? I, I think that that is quite interesting because although you're going to games and you watch the game, you're not really analysing it. If you go to a game, GP, you're not there to analyse the game, are you? You're just there to watch the game, enjoy the game, you know? Mm. And Jim Moore says he can only enjoy the game when Celtic are 3 nothing up. Uh, we need to have three clear goals or he just can't enjoy himself. He's still... Um, nah, he's still, he's still um, uh, what's the word? He's still um, burned by the 90s. That's what it is. And he was... <laughs> yeah, as, as we all scar. are. Yeah, that is a scar for the 90s, definitely. Um, but when you obviously cover the games as we do on a Celtic state of mind, you do watch it completely differently. In fact, you probably can't enjoy it as much because you're taking notes, you're looking at discussion points, etc. And obviously, I never ever looked at Mastorovic, you know, with that kind of degree of depth 
um, in detail. So when I mention them, I just I just kind of remember him being a big imposing guy at the back. I would need to really look at what his attributes were, what his really good performances were. I would need to really retrack that period. Um, there's not there's not that, a DVD, Paul. There's not a DVD. I don't think they ever released the Daniel Mustorovich DVD. <laughs> is there not even a show on YouTube? Um, no, there might, might be, but the, I, I don't the, the thing with it. Most of the games were televised. Most of the 90 minutes of those games were were shown yeah. live. And um, I'm just trying to remember, I was going through certainly the tail end of his period at Celtic on the Arthur McKenna, Logelli, CSC. I think for maybe 18 months to two seasons, I was on that bus at that time. Um, so my story of it would have been all about it at that stage. Yeah, I know. I was disappointed my story of it's never got a DVD for all these highlights that he had, but um, I, I might revisit my story of it. However, Starfelt is ahead of him in the pecking order, but, you know, he's not getting ahead of you and Mialbe. Absolutely no, not. No, no, chance. no chance. Absolutely not. Absolute hero of a guy. I know. I know. And look at him. He still looks phenomenal for his age. Patrick Harold, afternoon to you. Afternoon to everybody. Over a thousand strong. I love it on a Thursday. I love getting a catch up with JP. As we said at the top of the show, he's a busy guy. You're a busy guy. So I'm actually getting a catch up with you as well as talking to you about Celtic as well. And double denim, afternoon to yourself. JP, I've got to mention this. Uh, you love your Celtic jerseys, as do I. Um, we now have a new initiative. It just... It happened very naturally with regards to raising cash. Because we do interviews, we're going to have a lot more of them on the channel, actually sit down interviews with ex-Celtic players. We've got a few on the channel with Alan Thompson and you know Mike Galloway and, and a few others. Willie McStay's on there. Um, we're going to do a lot more of that kind of thing because we do come into contact with ex-Celtics. We're very privileged in that respect. Um, and we do a live events with them. We're going to do a charity drive. We're currently doing a charity drive where... We've got a pile of Celtic jerseys too. We're going to get them signed by every ex Celt that we know that we come into contact with JP. And once we get 20, 20 odd sig signatures, we're going to get them framed up, auction and raffle them off, give all the money to we Jamie Tierney, um, who we do speak about on, on the, the podcast quite a bit. And we're going to continue to speak about him because uh, he suffers from Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which I didn't even know. Uh, existed until I came into contact with Jamie's dad who told me all about it a uh, wee four year old guy from Fife Celtic fan and um, his mum and dad need to raise 60 grand a year just to treat their son so you can imagine how worrying and harrowing that is for any parent um, it, it's just it's terrible that you know there isn't a cure for this condition but there are ways to treat it and improve the kids uh, quality of life so it comes down to raising money we know that we've got a platform. We know that we've got a lot of people who are willing to help. So we're going to do it a wee bit differently. Um, I think our, our initial charity endeavours, JP, were the charity weekenders. We decided to do that a wee bit differently last year and we released a single um, where the wakes, uh, your pal Paul Sheridan was involved in that big time, actually. Um, we did in the video and, and it actually charted for a few days in various wee charts on uh, iTunes, Rock Chart and stuff like that. It was amazing, amazing to see. I think we were ahead of Mariah Carey at one point leading up to the, the Christmas time, JP. But this year, we're doing Sell the Jerseys and we've got loads out there. And I love the jerseys. We've even got like a match-worn Craig Gordon shirt out there. People are so generous. It's unbelievable. Um, and at the last count, we've got about 60 or 70 received and pledged. And hopefully we get like 100. And once they're all framed up, we can get a decent money for them. Um, and I knew that that would appeal to you, JP, because you're a massive Jersey fan, aren't you? Absolutely. Uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, I've definitely got one for you. So I'll, uh, I'll speak to you about that after the show. Good man. Um, Good man. Already signed as well. Um, but the uh, yeah, I, I, if I had a bigger parlour mansion, <laughs> I would I would have a room full of signed jerseys mm -hmm. for sure. Because I've got a few. I've got uh, my Neil Wennon uh, shirt from two thousand uh, two thousand and one when he signed. I got I got the jump shirt. I've told this story before, but I got um, I asked for Lennon on the back, so I took my jersey of that season, and I, when he, the week he signed, I got Lennon on the back, but they didn't have any uh, SPL letters left. Mm -hmm. They had an SPL number, so I got the 18, but they didn't have the lettering. They were like, we've only got EPL lettering, which was slightly different font, so I got that. The reason being, actually, was because they'd run out of L's. They'd run out of SPL L's because um, fans of a certain club had uh, gone out and 
got flow on the back of their top and in, in, their, in their numbers probably because it was only three letters <laughs> and it was cheaper it's, it's, it it's cheap to, option yeah it used to be buy the letter back in the day and um, now it's like it's just a set price for a name but uh yeah i've got that i've got i've got a barcelona strip signed by Risto stoichkov um which is remarkable the prize possession actually gave it to a friend was that the petrov uh, was that the petrov game yeah, yeah, I've got. Aye. I, 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 my friend Gav's got it. He, uh, he started a framing, a shirt framing business, and uh, I gave it to him for uh, advertising purposes, so he could post pictures of it on his on his site. And he still got it, so I need to get that back. Get it back, uh, mate. I <laughs> no, sure. Uh, I also got given as a gift the uh, the people's away strip, the the much derided uh, people's mm-hmm. away shirt. I got that given as a gift, but it had been signed by Tommy Burns' Celtic team, which is, all, is, is out of it's out of whack with it with the, with the timing. Like you would you wouldn't mm-hmm. expect to have that shirt signed by Van Hoydonk, Cadetti, the Canio, and all of that because they never wore it. But it must have just been the only shirt at the time. And my friend Graham had it in a lockup and remembered that he had it. And he just one day I met him in town during lockdown. Met him in town for a coffee, and he just. Handed me it over the table in a Costa, and I was like, "What?" <laughs> and I opened it out. And it was like fully signed by the Tommy Burns team, which ah, is pretty brilliant. Fun. Yeah, no, that that is it is. And by the way, it's great when like people win things or, or come across things and just think, you know, what it's a good cause. There you go, uh, and we'll do it. We'll get it all framed up and all that. There's a framer just nearby that we use, and um, you know, we could really make a, a right dent. In, in the next 12 months fees, if you like, 60 grand, we could really, you know, the targets to try and make 20 grand JP and um, maybe pay for one of the one of the sessions for, for the kids. So really looking forward to that. And thank you for your generosity um, as well. I see you've got the, the black jersey behind you. I'm going to mention it. You've also got uh, memories of Anthony H. Wilson. Um, it's 16 years today, isn't it? Since he passed away. Yeah. yeah, it is. I uh, um I, I still still really really regret not getting the opportunity to meet him just to just to shake his hand and uh or even have like five minute chat with him i think had i got into the music game if you want to call it that if they got into it a little bit earlier there's maybe a chance i would have been able to be at something that he would have been at like talking at or something like that but um unfortunately yeah, he passed away this on this day, two thousand and seven, um, and similar thing. They were raising money to try and uh, get um, uh, medication to 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 fight the cancer that he was that he was suffering from, um, mm-hmm. and and it was just it was just I think it was too expensive. It was far too expensive to. I don't know if there's been progression in uh, medicine nowadays that would mean that it's not like that anymore. I, I've not looked into that, but. As for him as a person, just a total hero of mine, and pff, you want to dig deep on Anthony on Anthony H. Wilson, as he liked to call himself latterly. No Anthony H. Wilson, no uh, club culture as we n- knew it anyway in the nineties and in the noughties. Mm-hmm. I don't know; if it's still the same now. I mean, but the, his influence just stretches across so many different genres of music and and culture and. Uh, Factory Records, New Order, Joy Division, Happy Mondays, <laughs> like Unbelievable. All, the, all the DJs that came out of the Hacienda, like um, uh, Dave Haslam, Dave Haslam, yeah, and, yeah, all those guys. Um, and, and and anyone, who, anyone out there who's thinking, what's this to do with Celtic? I'm going to link it into Celtic, right? So on Factory Records was a band called the Deruti Column. You'll be aware of them, and they do. There you go. They do for me the best version of the Fields of Athens Rye. Seek it out. Oh, yeah. I think I've mentioned it before. I seek it oh, out yeah. on YouTube. They've got a guest, Coming female vocalist. Oh, yeah. it's phenomenal. So get on it. If you're wondering why we're talking about Tony Wilson, we love our music. And there is a Celtic link, very tenuous, but it's there nonetheless. JP, I've been looking at a few things. Uh, Staff Elks out, like you say, Novroski, yeah, we brought him in. Brilliant. He looks great. I think he, he, he looks the part. If I'm going to be overly critical, we should have won that header for the first goal against Ross County. But I also think Joe Hart needs to be... Hey, I thought that was Joe Hart. Everyone's playing Joe Hart in that goal. 
I think it's threefold, right? We've got the wrong guy on the on the post. You know, you don't. I know sometimes it's strange because Bernabe was on the post. That's why he scored the goal against Gamba Osaka. He was on that post, and it's just like put the wee guy on the post. But if they put it in the post to stamp, the wee guy's not going to get the header on it. So anyway, Kyogo's on there. You can't blame him. Joe Hart needs to command his area, no doubt. But the big fella needs to win the header. So, you know, I think it's it's combined. Uh, the responsibility is combined in there. And uh, hopefully, and I'm pretty sure he will grow in stature. Going back to your previous point, you know, Carter Vickers making any old centre-half look good. It doesn't work like that. Otherwise, Kobayashi would be a world-beater. Um, and I heard the same argument about Van Dyke. you know. Uh, a lot of people say Denier wasn't the player you thought he was because Van Dyke made him look better. Denier has gone on, you know, to play for a very successful, a very strong Belgian national side. I don't think he's chosen his moves wisely. JP, I know that he was at Lyon uh, for a spell, but, you know, Denier was a player in his own right. It wasn't just, yeah, they had a good partnership. It wasn't just down to Van Dyke. I'm going to throw this one at you, though, because there are people, uh, many people, and quite rightly so, on social media talking about, oh, no, that's as weak again. We don't know what Norovsky brings. Um, he's going to have to bed in, he's going to have to build that partnership, absolutely. But if you look at the last 12 months, I'm going to say 12 months, correct me if I'm wrong, I reckon that we've signed, uh, sorry, we've lost a few what you would regard as first-team players. And I just want to know your thoughts on uh, who we've replaced them with and whether or not we can even say at this stage if we've done done it sufficiently. So Starfelt goes, Noroski's back, he's in. We don't know yet. He's only played one game. Yakamakis goes, was O his replacement? Jota's left. I don't think we signed Tilly or Yang to replace Jota. I, I keep going on about the fact that Abada, I think, is naturally going to replace him. But we brought in two right wingers. Zhiranovic leaves. We bring in Johnston. Moy retires. We bring in Holm, who is obviously not a first pick at this moment in time. Do you see that as us weakening the side, or do you think it's too early to say? Ah, I mean, we're, we're three weeks away from the end of the transfer window. Our business, our Celtics business, has been done way in the window, uh, usually. Or certainly, some of the big signings that we've brought in in recent years have all been, some of them, on the last day. Um, I hope that's not the case this season. If it is, obviously, I'll live with it. But um, you'd rather get players in earlier, especially when we've got as, a, as my friend Chris texted me this morning, seven of our next 11 fixtures are away from home. So mm. it's going to come fast at us in the next few weeks. So you, you, you don't want to be left short if you're, you've are you got injuries or whatever. So you would rather have the players in. I think it's just the nature of, of football that like you, you, we couldn't have legislated for Jota leaving to go to Saudi Arabia for 20 20, 20, 25 million, whatever it was. That, that came completely out of nowhere. Certainly, that, uh, to me anyway, I would never have said last season, oh yeah, Jota's going to go for that sort of money <laughs> to Saudi Arabia. Just And there's, there's also chat of him apparently maybe going out on loan already. I, I don't know if that's just nonsense paper talk, but surely, surely that. not. You're not paying that money and then putting a guy out on loan. I wouldn't. And the same was said about Ryan Kent in, in Turkey, which I would have said was probably more likely, but because um, they got him on a free. But he paid twenty five million or whatever the figure was. Uh, you wouldn't wouldn't expect somebody to go out on loan after it. But I and, and obviously Starfield leaving was probably not expected by us until it happened. But I think the club would have expected it to happen. Um, but I'm, I'm, we were in a really strong position, I thought, as a club and as a, a squad anyway. So I would be focusing more on the players that need to leave that aren't going to give any meaningful con contribution this season. Like the amount of money that must be getting hemorrhaged on wages is uh, mental. I know. That's a frustration, JP, when you lose a, a player that is contributing, isn't it? As you've got all these guys in the background who are not playing. I mean, I like Stephen Welsh. I've said it on here many, many times. He played six games last season. He never started mm -hmm. six games. He made six appearances last season. That that, that type of contribution, you, you can't keep players like that at the club, you know? Mm -hmm. So And there's loads of them. Sorrow. We're struggling to get rid of a lot of these players now because they're on decent wages, JP. 
I mean, if they want to dig their heels in, they can see out their contract. Personally, on a professional level, I think it's a bad idea because a player can't all of a sudden just click right back into full sharpness, full fitness. And I think that they're, you know what, they're doing themselves out a couple of years of their career if they do that. You know, McCarthy's maybe in the same position, but um, no, I, I get that. That That's my biggest frustration when we, we lose a player who is a, a, a first-team player, a contributor, as you've got all these guys who don't contribute anything to the club, mm. you know, and you, you would much rather... And by the way, there's nine or ten of them because that list I had on which David Turnbull appeared, um, nine of the players were not contributing to Celtic's first team. So... Mm. That, that's a big thing. And if they're all going 10 grand a week on average, that is, because a Yeti is on a lot more than that, it's 100 grand a week. That is crazy money to be losing without a single ball being kicked, JP. Mm. You know, so there needs to be a lot of outgoings as well. I, I'm obviously interested to get as many thoughts as possible. Uh, CJ talks about the Hacienda now being a block of flats. I drove past that last time I was down in Manchester for the, the Football Blogging Awards. Um, love it says don't get PJD on the music. JP's worse than me, mate. I mean, it's, it's obviously when we're together, we just can't help it, right? Um, and there's another one here. Uh, Plunge McNugget actually recommends the rain experiment, JP. There's a recommendation for you. Um, but Diaz88 says the Dubliners do it best. You're talking about the Fields Rath and Rye. I get it. Um, and I absolutely get it. And Phyllis Kirk says less music talk, more talk about our failure to prepare in Europe. Well, we're talking about the Dubliners and the Fields Aff and I see what we did there. We brought it right back to Celtic. And yeah, we are going to be talking about European aspirations. Um, five gone, five first team players gone in 12 months. Have we strengthened them? Have we replaced them sufficiently? Let us know in the comments section. Everybody will have their own view on it. Um, I, I see a lot of chat on the social media saying that we're weaker now. JP, it's hard to argue that in terms of the, the first 11. The, the argument that I, I keep trying to put forward, and it's more nuanced, is that Brendan Rodgers is here, right? And I think he's going to add quality to some of the existing players, like guys we've already mentioned, Matt, Matt O'Reilly, like Lee Labada, perhaps David Turnbull, one or two others that we've not seen yet. Is he going to make Kyoko a better player? This is the thing. He's playing a slightly different game, isn't he? I, I, it was noticeable, without being overly familiar with the intricacies of football tactics, but it was noticeable that Kyogo was dropping uh, deep on Saturday. You could, you could just obviously, you, if you're watching the game as a fan in the ground, you're like, right, what's going on here? Because you're not privy to the instructions that are being given at the side of the pitch. But um, obviously, he came deep, and you could see his involvement in the game from that from that aspect allowed the midfield to to get more involved in the and in going forward and and the, because there was space. So that potentially was creating space for the likes of Turnbull and O'Reilly to get in there. And you you would hope that O'Reilly sort of contributes with more goals this season because I think that was definitely you could see his frustration. I think it took him ages to score a goal for mm. was it last season? I think it was last season. It, yeah. He hadn't scored ages and then I, I think he scored into, into the Jock Steen and he mouthed up at the sky finally like and, and it's it's quite cool when you can when you can read a player's uh, words and he just said he was like finally because like he obviously was very frustrated at the fact that he wasn't chipping mm -hmm. in with goals and maybe with the tweaks to the system this season Matt O'Reilly becomes a you know 10 15 or more goals a season player and if you're getting that level of goals from from a midfielder then you're you're doing well and then it might mean that Kyogo doesn't have the burden that he's had because I mean he's by and large scored the majority of our goals I mean we're a decent spread sort of throughout the rest of the team but uh, there's been a heavy reliance on Kyogo for goals um, 54, 54 in two seasons, you know. That's and in and, and the first from. season, he had the injuries. He had, I think mm. he was out for two or three months in total, mm. spread over the two different injuries that he had, JP. Um, yeah, I think I mean, definitely Brendan Rodgers is the type of guy that wants that spread of goals, doesn't he? He, he, mm. would want, he wouldn't want it just the the burden to be on one player's shoulders. Rather, he'd rather have like it going around the whole team so that you're not, if you happen to do to miss him through injury or whatever, then you bring Maeda and play him through the middle or 
oh, when he comes back, can't believe he's out for six to eight weeks. That's a that's a bit of a right. blow. It really is, right? And, you know, going into this transfer window, I was thinking we need to strengthen in goals. Centre half, left back, left wing, and, you know, if I'm being greedy, up top. And that, I said that from day one. And what, what we brought in, right? So we brought in a centre half. Um, we have brought in two players who can play on the left. Uh, I'm reminded Tilio can play on the left. He's effective on the left. Um, and also Yang, who I think looked pretty good out right, can also switch over to the left. Um, and it was interesting to see Abada obviously switching over there as well. So whether we buy another left-sided player, I'm not sure. Uh, left back, I'm not convinced with the backup. And if you bring in a player in, get him to challenge Greg Taylor. But the one that a lot of people disagreed with me on was was the striker. And I just think this here is the example. So O's out for six weeks. Um, so Kyogo's backup. Who is, who's Kyogo's backup now? Maida, probably because he obviously uh, reminded us that he can play centre-forward in pre-season. And then if that happens, who's made his back up on the left? Then, for me, you're really dropping down, because then you're looking at Haxabanovic, James Forrest, Abada on his weaker side, Yang on his weaker side. And that, that's why I thought another striker was something we should be. And you know what? Probably more, I'd be more satisfied in bringing in that, that project-type third-choice striker, JP rather than a project left-back or a project left -back. Up top, I'd be happy to spend two or three million quid on a 21 to 23-year-old with loads of promise as a prospect. But we've not done that. I don't even think we're in the market for it, are we? It doesn't sound like it. I've certainly not heard anybody being mentioned. And uh, I, I, I would highly doubt that we would just go out and sign somebody for the sake of it in the short term to cover or oh, mm -hmm. we probably find that we'll go in the first of September as we are up 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 there. I just I, it doesn't really seem like the the Celtic way to go out and get somebody. Uh, you know, there was a chat of uh, the guy for West Ham is it Antonio? Um, I think he was linked. Let's um, not forget a Yeti. A Yeti still in the building. Well, I mean. That's if another reason there. for not bringing anybody else in, you know. Well, but if he, if he's there and he's training and everything else, excuse me, I know he's not really featured in any. You would not know that Albion Yeti is there. Put it that way, because he's not exactly. There's not exactly been action shots of him at training or anything. This <laughs> it's just no. He's just a, he's just a name that you know is still there and still has a squad number. But I mean, the amount of money we're probably paying him a week. Whether or not he is going to have a future at Celtic, if we need to use him in the short term, use him. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be against that. I mean, it's probably people will be like, "Oh my God, how could you possibly suggest that?" But I mean, he's a football player. He's getting paid by us. Why wouldn't you, you know, include him? Who's who's to say that he doesn't come in and, and chip in with a couple of goals? Um, if he doesn't get the move before the end of August, we're stuck with the guy. So we, we need to we need to think about making use of him. There's no point in just unless he's being, you know, uh, a disruptive influence in in the in the dressing room. Which he never really struck me as the type of guy that would be like that. Unless he's been like that, then it would be madness to just be like, oh well you're you're not good enough or you you've not got a long term future at Celtic, we're not going to use you. Um if he's getting paid like fifteen, Handsome twenty, twenty five grand a week, then why would you not try and make use of that guy? Um that would be some resurrection, eh? If if he was to that, back on oh the scene. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine I know that? Brendan Rogers is good, but this this is taking it to another level. <laughs> Turning water into wine. Uh, uh, I, I would love it. I'd get me brilliant if he came back and scored. Because um, it, it, would, it would be some redemption, wouldn't it? I just can't wait for people to, on the comment section, accuse us of saying that yet is the answer. Um, I'll just We're leave not it all saying that. <laughs> Jungle Lion still thinks Rogers will bring in three and loan or sell out four or five. Yes, I, I do expect quite a lot of departures, actually. I mean, there's obviously the younger guys as well who are Clearly not going to develop in the fifth tier. Uh, Summers and McPherson could be on their way to the, the Dunfermline, Queen's Park, that type of move. That's all important. Uh, and I'm not too concerned about the homegrown thing because there, there has been occasions where Brennan's spoken about having a squad of 17 and then making up the difference with eight 
young guys, JP, who are not going to kick a ball in the Champions League, but they're registered as players. And I know that they are taking a jersey off someone else who might be on the fringe, but Rogers seems quite confident that he can run with 17 in the tournament um, as a core squad. So we'll see how that works out. Danielle, welcome back to the show. It's always great to see you getting involved. Uh, you don't want players that don't want to be here disrupts the team. I think you're talking about uh, Starfield, um, but also you know, let's talk about Hatati maybe uh, kind of pushing for a move. So we'll need to see how that works out. JJ Celtic, uh, hope Celtic have a few aces up their sleeve. Wouldn't surprise me. It really wouldn't surprise me if we do, because how often have we announced a player and they've not been mentioned, JP? They've not been the guy that we all expected them to sign. Uh, Michael Ross reckons it's an underwhelming transfer window so far. Well, for me, the best sign so far has been Brendan Rodgers himself, and I'm going to stick to that, even though I was gutted when he left. Is it safe to say this is more of a rebuild than we thought it was, JP? I, I suppose there is an element of it, especially now that you've lost um, <laughs> for the derby, especially now that you've lost two nailed-on first-team players, like Starfelt mm -hmm. played almost every game the last two years, Jota the same, so that in itself is a rebuild because you're looking to get two more players in that are absolute, you know, first names in the team sheet um, every, every week. Um, just on, on redemption for players, James Forrest nearly scored one of the best goals I've ever seen for Celtic on Saturday, but but for a really, really good save from the, the Ross County keeper. That, that move, like 13 seconds it took for that ball to get up to... Uh, Forrest from, from the right back position and if James Forrest had scored that goal would that have gone any way to appeasing a lot of the people that really don't like James Forrest and don't want him anywhere near the team because that would have been a goal in, our game, in, a, in, a, in a meaningful fixture in a, an important first first game of the season would, would have put a bit more of a shine on a victory 4-2 Looking at it, having not if you've not seen the game, you're like, oh, that that's going to be a bit tight. Five two is a bit different, and I, I always think just the same way as he, as he scored the hat trick last season. People are very quick to forget that it's it's it, it, or it's just like, oh, it was only a hat trick against Hibs. It was three. It was a hat trick for one, and it was three goals that contributed towards our league title success. So. And it, pro it proves that James Forrest has still got something to offer. The people want him out the door. I, I think it's. I think it'd be crazy to to ship him. It comes down to contribution. You think of a player like we've just spoke about a yeti, tongue in cheek. Um, for the most part, apparently he's training on his own JP. But Forrest mm. contributes. If he had scored that goal, that would have been a fifteenth season in a row. <laughs> no one, no one in the history of Celtic have scored fifteen goals. Consecutively, am I right? In 15 seasons consecutively, no it one in the history of the club has done that. Only three players in the history of the club have scored and assisted 100 goals each. You know, the, the guy is one of the most decorated Celtic, and he's not just sitting there claiming his wages every week like some of the guys we've spoken about. He's contributing. Oh, wow. He'll score this season, JP. He will break that record, and he deserved his testimonial. And I'm on the, the James Forrest. <laughs> train. train, yeah. Um, listen, really enjoyed it as I always do with JP on a Thursday afternoon. Let us know your thoughts in the comment section in relation to all the topics of conversation. Are we weaker? Uh, are you happy with the transfer window so far? Do you think Brendan Rodgers has a few aces up his sleeve? Let us know in the, the comment section. Uh, over a thousand live on the Thursday bulletin today. Absolutely fantastic. The uh, Charlie Mulgrew and Aidan McGeady gig has completely sold out. Not a ticket to be had, but uh, keep your eyes peeled on the social for an announcement. We've got a massive gig that's already confirmed in October that's not been announced yet and we will hopefully be announcing a gig in September very soon in the coming days. Uh, thanks everybody for your support on selling the jerseys. We will continue to raise cash for We Jamie Tierney. If you want to donate to the fund, I have put the link underneath this video. All that's left for me to say, JP Mason, thank you for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind.